Uh, cool. So yeah, I'm Matteo. Hi everyone. Um, I work for Alpha Sites here in London. Uh, I do mainly Rails and Ember stuff. Uh, more Rails now, but I like to do more Ember in the future. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, web sockets and Ember data. What does it mean to uh, to try to uh, get some different sources of data other than their typical, you know, um, REST, REST, HTTP uh, response from the server? Um, and which pitfalls you may encounter uh, while trying it. So yeah, this is a little bit about me. Uh, by the way, we are hiring as well. Um, so without, okay, so let's let's jump in. So w what you're used to as an Ember developer, but I mean every uh, client uh, uh, writing uh, developer knows that uh, when. Uh, when you write a, uh, when you want to create a resource, what you typically do is you uh, you create an object. Uh, for example, in Ember, let's say you create a task, and then you post to the server. Uh, you know you're gonna have your tasks root, and then the server uh, creates the task, gives you back the the JSON response, and then the client will take care of updating uh, the object that uh, it, it created before. That's how Ember data works, and this is how like uh, the Ember data expects uh, the data to flow. Um, so this is an example of the code. So you have uh, your create record method, uh, and then at the beginning the ID is not present. Then you save it, and then in your in your when your promise resolves, which means that the server has responded with some some JSON, uh, which re will represent the task probably. Then you will have your ID, so the the task will have uh, updated use attributes from uh, what's coming from the server. Um, so, let's say now you wanna you wanna have you wanna have data coming live from the server. Uh, why? Because maybe uh, you wanna make your application live, right? So you you have multiple clients connected to the application, and you wanna have data. Uh, w for example, someone creates a task and someone else is looking at the list and he wants to see th that task uh, coming up in the list without doing anything. So what you're going to do, you're probably going to, you, all your clients are going to create a connection with the server. Um, then if somebody creates a task, uh, you're going to, uh, the, the simplest thing you can do is uh, just do your usual post request to the server. Uh, the server creates the tasks. And then it sends to the to the client the same client, but also all the other connected clients, a, a payload of the JSON uh, representing that resource. So you will have uh, a, a representation of that of that task that you can use uh, in your application. Uh, now Ember Data has a handy method called called push payload. Uh, this is so for for like uh, simplicity purposes. I've tr I I cho I've chosen Pusher um, because it's very simple. It has a handy API, and uh, but I mean this this talk is uh, can be used for uh, for any kind of you know web socket uh, connection. So live data coming from the, from on the same connection. Uh, but, but with Pusher, the way you do it is you basically define these callbacks. Uh, so you you bind you subscribe to uh, channels, and then you get this data. Uh, on the client, and when whenever uh, data comes, this uh, this callback is gonna to get called. So you can use your push payload function, and anything that that comes from uh, from the server, uh, it will be interpreted as you know uh, as the same uh, if, if if it came from uh, from a REST uh, HTTP requ uh, response will be the same. Uh, so. Uh, th th it's the same, like uh, the idea at the beginning is not set, then you save it, and then y you wait, which means like uh, as soon as the connection, uh, as the, your server, sorry, as pusher sends the data, uh, your task will have uh, its ID. And this, this is true for, for any client connected. So you'll have your task with, with the ID set. Now, mixing these two approaches has some problems. Um, because Ember data is, in order to be fast and, and, make, and make your application feel snap, uh, snappy, is going to create immediately a record uh, in, the, uh, in your application. And then it, it will update it behind the scenes without you noticing. Uh, 
so it will give it an ID and you, you don't know uh, you don't know it and uh, and so when then the if if pusher comes f before this it can happen that there are two records I I, I can show it to you um, so I have an application here now whoops <laughs> sorry um, so um, what's gonna happen oh, is it sorry I forgot to update <laughs> sorry guys um, well if it's taking too much time I can just um, well uh, anyway let's see let's see if it doesn't take too much Okay, so okay. So I have my. This is an application we use internally at Alpha Sites to like track tasks and stuff like that. So the way it works, if I if I'm gonna add something, uh, this is a test. So. Okay, you saw that there it flickered. Well, let me try again. So the way I did it basically is um, so maybe it's it's a bit slow with pusher, so it's coming late. Uh, maybe the connection is a bit slow. Um, anyway, I added a slip here uh, to 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 slow the the server, but the, the purpose was that basically. Uh, if if the if the client uh, if the if pusher comes before the server responds, um, you're gonna have two records in, in your list because one is the the record created by by Ember, uh, which will get the ID later, and then uh, pusher will send its own ac record with the ID already set. So and and Ember data has no way of distinguishing these two because it one of one of the two doesn't have an ID yet. So the way I solved it. Uh, is um, I created a, pl uh, mix, a mixin that you can use, uh, actually two mixins, one for models and one for controllers that you can use to make them immediately live. So if you include your pushable, um, your pushable mix in your, in your controllers uh, and you pass it the name of the method, uh, sorry, uh, of the resource, um, your, uh, your model, uh, the array uh, beneath the array controller will be live. So and it will, it will receive immediately uh, records from your, from your server, uh, provided that uh, they, like the server and the client have to uh, obey a, a certain contract. And uh, so how, how does it work internally? So the, the client has to generate a unique client ID, uh, which will be included in the payload. And the client ID will be returned by the server both in the uh, pusher and in the um, in the HTTP uh, response uh, payload, and uh, this is provided by this is done automatically by the, the mixins that I've created. So you don't have to do anything. You just include the mixins, and these uh, th the client will will include the ID. Um, now th these are the uh, the uh, the channels that the client expects um, as a communication way. And if you're if you're using so this is an example of a of a payload you, you pass to the client ID inside the text the task and then the server returns the same client ID. Now now if you're using Rails, uh, you're lucky because you, uh, I created also a gem which is called Pushable Rails. So you can just include uh, the Pushable model and uh, in the, in your model and uh, the Pushable serializer in your serializer, and you will get the same conventions apply so so basically the, the client and the, the server will know how to to, uh, to talk uh, because the the server will include now the the client ID uh, automatically in the in the response and it, it will communicate on the right channels based on uh, uh, class names so so the code is very simple this is the code for uh, for the client so uh, it uses ember pusher which is uh, another um, library 
Um, so uh, these these are the channels uh, that get like uh, the model name create, update, and destroy. <coughs> the channels of communication, and then there is uh, on the top there is the uh, model mixing that you can use uh, to have this client ID attribute. And then for pusher, it's just m uh, well just a, a module that you, you can include and it will, as soon as it commits to the server, it will uh, communicate to the right channels uh, the, the, the serialized model. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, questions? Yeah. How does it handle errors, uh, like data validation? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good question. Um, well, I usually uh, try to, opt uh, when, when I'm building this kind of stuff, I usually try to optimize uh, validating stuff on the client and, of, and the server usually should, pro should communicate just errors right, I that are not. I wasn't clear, I was meaning server sites. So the server rejects it for some reason. Mm -hmm. how, how would this system or how would you adapt the system to support that? Okay, so uh, if, if there isn't any error, it's probably not going to save the resource. So it won't trigger the pusher, uh, the pusher update. So what you're going to get is just the Ember Data uh, model in your, uh, in your uh, array controller. So you can treat it the usual way, which means uh, you're probably going to, to show the, the user some, that some error has happened. But the, the task will, will be there immediately because the way Ember Data works, it will immediately say, okay, everything went okay, and then if something goes bad, you have to think about reverting it, uh, reverting what you've done, basically. Uh, as long as pusher doesn't come after, I mean, I mean, like, the worst case is probably pusher sends the, the payload and something bad happens, but I don't think that's gonna happen because if you're created it, and if the after commit uh, callback is safe enough, which I think it is. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So push payload is pretty awesome, in which it parses any uh, adapter compatible payload. So if you have, for example, if you have your active model uh, adapter, and you obey the, the rules that the Ember Data gives you, for example, you sideload. Uh, records and you reference them uh, using, I don't know, link attributes or IDs, uh, whatever you're used to with Ember Data, basically, it automatically works with push payload. payload. So you're going to have, um, it's pretty common that, uh, for example, you, I push co comments inside the task, uh, the task payload. I don't need to, to push a separate comment uh, payload and it, it works automatically the way you used to. Mm -hmm. Do you get a, a callback sort of, I mean, the information coming straight back to you? Or is it like one person pushes, you wait a while, and then everybody gets out of this? Do you understand what's saying? Yeah, yeah, well, so, sort of. I think, like, uh, you mean the way pusher works? Like, how does it, how does it send uh, payloads to separate, like, connected clients? Or... Uh, or if the, the person sending the, like, request, like, creating the task is getting also itself what back. What no? I mean is, like, when you normally, if you're not using Fisher, mm -hmm. and you call, like, model.save, yeah. then you can call pen on that, because from that save, you're going to get a response back. Yeah. Um, what I'm asking is, is that still the case? If you push data to the server, do you still get a response straight back to you as well as the data being pushed down to any other clients? Yeah. Or is it just like you wait for a while and then you're just one of the people who get the pushes? Yeah, yeah. So you, you still mix the approaches, which means that you still get back a response from the server. Uh, and then you, you also get the, uh, like, 
data coming from web sockets. You get both because you you don't really have a way. So one could arrive before the other. Yeah, exactly. You don't really have a way to distinguish people creating uh, stuff. You, you, when you send with pusher, you send to all the clients connected, which means you send also to the to the creator, which is gonna get the request the normal request from the, uh, response from the server. You don't have a way to distinguish. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a stupid question? So, yeah. so if I understood you, the idea here is that when you uh, send a post, you send a RESTful post request, yes. uh, and at the same time you also push over a WebSocket channel. No, no, it's the, the communication happens only from the server to the client, so you, you don't actually, w w in WebSockets. So the creation is done uh, through a normal okay. RESTful uh, okay. like life cycle. And then, and then you only get notified from the server. It's not the other way around. You don't communicate from the client to the server via the socket. Okay, so, so the use case, I'm trying to understand the use case is, I mean, it's, it, obviously web sockets in general are performance optimization and using mm -hmm. the network more effectively. Um, what is the use case that you're trying to achieve here? So the, the use case is you have multiple clients connected and you, you wanna have a communication channel basically between the server and and the clients, which which is not well, uh, which allows you to to send live uh, notifications to to any client connected, which you cannot achieve. I mean, you can use probably server side events, but uh, yeah, web sockets. Uh, if you use stuff with like Pusher, Pusher is going to use automatically web web sockets, and there is a lot of ecosystem of, of stuff behind web sockets. So yeah. Uh, I thought that was a good choice to uh, to send updates to, to clients. Do you have any metrics at all that can de demonstrate kind of the, the performance benefits of this approach versus just a more traditional one? So what? With pulling mechanisms and whatever. Uh, it's more about the same, isn't it? It's more about the same. More yeah. Clients. Like a, like a Google Doc when you connect it and everyone can see the changes simultaneously. Right. So one, one person sends them up and then everyone else sees them. So the other alternate, alternate would be a pulling mechanism, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah, which yeah. which means basically the performance gain you can get is how long you're gonna pull. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say one of the problems you said is that when you submit, if you get a push you have notification back before that submission is yeah. finished. When you connect to push you get a, a session ID and if you post that with your 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 create post oh, okay. then when you publish your events to push you can say send to everyone except for this session ID. So you can say don't send it back to the originator, basically. Okay, yeah. So you can get rid of that problem because you know that everything that you've done, you're not going to get notification for everyone else will. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, for, for, this, uh, for this case, I, I used like a generic approach, but uh, this, is, this is a good advice for Pusher. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Um, can you limit the number of connections to a channel, like for example, I want to update tasks for uh, a certain group of users who are, you know, but there are other users that don't have, you know, are not scoped to that task. Okay. Um, yeah, in that case, probably I would create a channel uh, named differently uh, for that subset of users, so that those users can connect uh, to that specific task. So when you create it, you can you can create a channel for that task with the ID of the task maybe, and you can send updates on that channel. Uh, but yeah, it's just that uh, my my gems don't don't, don't do that. But uh, it's definitely doable. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is an ignorant question, but what do you do on the server side to support web sockets? How do you have the server? So the, the, the WebSockets part is co uh, and handled completely by Pusher. So uh, Pusher provides a gem. So you can just say pusher.trigger, and then you pass the, the name. Uh, it's just, well, it's just push. It's on I don't know if it's readable. But it's just pusher.trigger, and then you pass the name of the channel, and then the payload. Basically. But surely the HTTP server needs to support web sockets, doesn't it? Or is that just baked in? Or no, no, because uh, so you you communicate with your server through 
HTTP normal you know RESTful request, and then it's the server that needs to communicate to pusher, and then and and it's the client directly that com that connects to pusher through ja the JavaScript library basically. So the server doesn't need doesn't need to talk web sockets this way. This is like or the sure faster. It's a third party service. Yeah, it's a it's a yeah uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's where my yeah. Although I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that both you know the browser and the web server do support, they have to support sockets, but that's well established. It's been around for quite some time. Pusher sits on top of that stack, yeah. and it provides a more user usable interface on the server side to, to interact with the sockets. But in fact, effectively, sockets and server side events and all those things, those, have, they, those do have to be supported, I think, on the, on the server, don't they? Yeah, they are, but if you, if you were going to Provide your own push events over web sockets. You have to figure out how, figure out how that would scale to yeah. thousands of subscribers at once. Where it's push it. Oh, uh, so I'm not at all suggesting that someone shouldn't use pusher. In fact, I mean, web sockets, unlike server side events, uh, strip out a lot of the details. So you do need something like pusher API. Otherwise, you're taking up a lot of work yourself. But server side events, for instance, as another example, is you know, it is actually. Um, Sorry? Uh, no. No, uh, I haven't heard about it. Ah, okay. No, I haven't tested it. Well, fine. Are there any more questions? Thank you.